Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Asians and normal people, the time has come for my most educational video to date. I'll admit, I've been a bit of a cock tease with the end times lore. Like you would have thought I would have made this video sooner with my three part series detailing the fate of the legendary lords during the end times doing so well, plus my reasonably successful Age of Sigma video. Well, the reason why I didn't make this video sooner is because I'm an autistic cunt. And that's it really. I'll be de detailing the entire events of the end times from start to end, explaining the fate of all factions, including their best and worst moments. If you're a diehard fan of Cathay, Nippon, or the Southern Realms, then I am so sorry. Games Workshop fucking shat all over you guys. However, I will still tell you what happened to your faction, so you'll still have reason to watch this video and the ads that roll with it. If there is a particular character I missed out on, that you want to know about, just ask me and comment in the comments a question about them or, you know, what ended up happening to them and I'll let you know. If a certain character gets enough upvotes or people requesting that I do a lore video on them, then I'll make a separate video for the end times for them specifically. Before we get started, let me chuck on my kappa, twirl my Jew curls, because it's time for a word from our sponsor. If you really want to support me, but find donating to Patreons to be as cancer as I do, except Eric's Patreon, he, he really needs some patrons, then I have a solution. A partner with Fanatical Gaming to bring you guys some fucking sweet ass discounts on most video games out there. Last week, all Total War games and DLC were up to 60% off, so hats off to my viewers that took those deals. If you think you've missed out and you missed the boat, then you're completely wrong, my dude, as Vermintide 2 is currently 30% off, with hundreds of other games copying serious discounts. Well, more than hundreds. Get on that shit guys, my kangaroo broke its leg and it's really hard for me to get to work these days, so I need the monies for a new one. Just make sure you turn off that cheeky ad block and then we're Gucci. Also, one more thing, as funny as it may be guys, please don't try and copyright my fucking videos. It's really AIDS when I have to explain to YouTube why my Elliot Roger parody wasn't a shitty unreleased death metal song. Let's get into it. Now, The End Times was basically a fucking bum rush to close out hundreds of storylines in one plot, which is never going to end well, so at the start of The End Times, everyone is running around like a bunch of spaz cunts. Starting with the elves. Finubar, the current Phoenix King, realized he was super duper cursed by his god Assyrian, because apparently Assyrian is such a spiteful cunt about Malekith, you know, the notorious rapist king, not being king of all elves, that he has been draining all of his power just to curse all Phoenix kings with pride and misfortune, hence explaining why the high elves have so many fucking incompetent kings in the past. While brooding about being cursed and what to do about it, Malekith projects his spirit in front of Finubar and calls him a cunt before summoning a random ass bloodletter into Finubar's chambers. Now, Finubar is more than capable of taking out a single bloodletter, However, he decides that the only way to end the curse is to die, so he lets it kill him. In the meantime, Manfred and Arkin, who are trying to bring back Nagash, kidnap the Everchild Alithria, who turns out to be Tyrion's daughter, not Finubar's. Oof, controversy. However, no one except a few sneaky cunts know about this. Bad start for the High Elves. Tyrion is suitably unimpressed with the situation, especially as the Everqueen, aka his babe Alariel, fucked off to go help the Wood Elves without even telling him. Dashing over to the Dark Elves, a fuck off massive army of Cornite warriors and demons, led by Scarbrand and Valika the Bloody, launch a massive invasion against Nagaroth. This went as bout as well as could be expected for Korn, as they didn't account for how fucking demented the people of Hard Geneth were, as the entire population ran out and started ripping Chaos to shreds as Malekith kills Scarbrand and Valika is defeated. However, as Chaos is basically limitless due to a good writing and fairness. Eventually, um, the limitless tide of chaos eventually breached the northern fortresses of Nagaroth um, and they destroy them. So Malekith decides to lead the biggest exodus the Dark Elves have ever had since the Sundering and leads them to Ulthuan. They salt the fields, burn down all their cities and kill millions of slaves as to leave absolutely nothing for the chaos armies to plunder. Oh yeah, and Malekith calls his mom a dumb bitch before he leaves. Mm, I approve. Thumbs, th thumbs up for that one, Malekith. Turns out Teclis is a sneaky little bitch, as he had been manipulating various parties in pretty rough ways in order to achieve the greater good. For example, he took down the magic wards guarding Finubar so Malekith could summon the demon to kill him. He also cleared the path to allow Manfred and Arkin to kidnap the Everchild. Process, process that for a second. Teclis helped some undead creatures kidnap his brother's daughter, his niece, knowing that she would die. 
cunt is ruthless. Teclis was doing on this on the instructions of his god Lilith, as only Malekith could unite all the elves together, being the chosen of Assyrian and whatnot, you know. Whilst the Everchild had to be sacrificed in order to help bring back Nagash in a weak enough state, they would actually cooperate with the world instead of trying to destroy it and turn everyone into a bunch of zombie fucks. You know, simultaneous uh, goodness. Anywho, Teclis tells Imric, Prince of Kalidor, that despite Malekith being the worst person ever, he's their king, so he has to suck it up and team up with him. Imric's like, mmm, okay, and consults his ancestor Kalidor the Dragon Tamer, who's still having a shit one stuck inside the vortex. Kalidor verifies his story, so Imric, Kalidor, and Kalidor's dragons team up with Malekith and bash up some high elves. Um, Kalidor is in the nation, not the guy. He's, he's very much in the vortex having a shit one. Um, Malekith goes into the fire of Asurian for attempt number two, and this time he isn't a little bitch, and he stays in there for long enough for the remaining power of Asurian to enter him, killing Asurian and instating Malekith as the Eternity King, which means King of all elves. Hmm. He finally got what he wanted. Without raping. There's a lesson for you, kids. During this fiasco, Ilaria went to the Wood Elves and found Isha and the Oak of Ages in a pretty bad shape. The Wood Elves thought this was the Chaos Corruption entering the world, however it was actually Lilith, the, an elven god, who was doing it. Ilaria absorbs the demented as fuck Isha into her, becoming even more powerful and gaining the loyalty of Orion and the Wood Elf forces. Upon hearing that Malekith has become the Eternity King, Alaril returns to Ulthuan via some weird underground world root system and instantly marries Malekith. You know, like, despite the fact that when she first married Finubar, Malekith summoned a Slaneshi demon to try and rape and kill her. I, I, I guess she's just the forgiving type. Alright, now bear with me for a second. Imagine being Tyrion while all this is going down. You've sworn your life to defending Ulthuan from the Dark Elves, and then in a short period of time, your daughter and king die because of your brother, your greatest enemy randomly becomes your new king, and then the woman you love goes and fucks him, and on top of this, you still have a small wiener. Naturally, Tyrion isn't happy about this and decides to become the avatar of Cain as he takes up Widowmaker and goes off to try and murder fuck everyone he doesn't like, which at this point is most people. Tyrion is joined by the High Elves, Dark Elves, and Wood Elves that worship Cain, along with Marathi that thinks Tyrion is a Narian reborn, while Malekith is joined by everyone else who aren't spasticated. Numerous battles are fought against Tyrion, however Tyrion wins all of them due to his just, you know, being the god of war and whatnot. He fights Imric, and despite Imric creating a small hole in Tyrion's armor, Tyrion defeats him, and Imric is able to escape with his life. In his next battle, Tyrion fights Alariel and Orion in the forests of Avalon. Orion kicks the shit out of Tyrion and rips open the hole in Tyrion's armor that um, Imric had previously created. However, Tyrion is able to stab Orion, killing him and Kurnos permanently. Alariel duels Marathi, but retreats when Orion falls. Tyrion and Malekith finally have their fateful duel on the Isle of the Dead as both armies collide in a massive climactic battle. Despite being empowered by Asurian, Malekith is no match for Tyrion, who by this point is literally just Cain, with Tyrion's body. Malekith is struck down, but before Tyrion can land the finishing blow, Anith Ania, the Shadow King, the mother fucking Shadow King, saves the day by shooting Tyrion through the heart in the hole that, in the armor that Orion and Imra created, killing him and Cain. However, the Shadow King is a bit of a memer, and he shoots Malekith as well for laughs. Non-fatally though, so it's fine. All elves swear loyalty to Malekith, as he leads all elven factions to Athel Lauren, while Teclis goes to undo the Vortex. You might be thinking, why the fuck is Teclis gonna undo the Vortex? Like, won't that ruin the world? And the answer is, yeah, kinda. See, Teclis figures that the world is ending, and there is no, currently no one powerful enough to truly challenge Chaos. Hence, that's why he wants to bring back Nagash. Also, by undoing the Vortex, he's basically freeing the Winds of Magic, which will then enter the bodies of various great heroes and champions, making them incarnates, who could be strong enough to beat back Chaos once and for all. This is confusing, but bear with me. Unbeknownst to Teclis, however, is that, however, is that Sigma himself is trapped within the Vortex, explaining why Sigma was the most absent god around. Teclis undoes the Vortex and Ulthuan sinks, drowning any elves who chose to stay behind, which actually was quite a lot. As it sinks, Slanesh sticks her juicy fat cunt out and eats as many elf souls as she can, including Kalidor, Dragon Tamer, and Marathi. 
Marathi tries to bargain with Slanesh, but this goes about as well as can be expected, and she's qu quickly eaten and damned to eternal rapage. Which is, you know, actually probably what she wanted. Bam, bitch, that's the elven fluff leading up to the climactic battle, but I'll get to that later. Now, it's time for my favorite skelly boy, Setra, the motherfucking imperishable. And he's less cool vampy friends. Not really friends, he hates them, but you know, you know, the people you have in your life where, oh yeah, they're my friends, but you know, they're fucking cunts. Yeah, I got some of those. Anyway, but wait, I need to explain some gay ass vampire fluff with Nagash and his pimps before we can get the tissues out and violently masturbate to Setra Law. Arkana Manfred went about stealing and kidnapping to bring all ingredients required together to bring back Nagash. They kidnapped the Fae Enchantress during the uh, Bretonian Civil War. They kidnapped the Everchild from Ulthuan. And they kidnapped Volkmar Grimm as he went to tell Manfred off. And Manfred's like, okay, like, yeah, you can tell me off. I'll just kidnap you. Um, and yeah, yeah, he really should have seen that coming, shouldn't he, old Volkmar? Like, everyone told him, Volkmar, don't go talk to Manfred. He's going to kidnap you. And Volkmar's like, nah, I'm, it's fine. It's fine. And, and here you go. I can't say I feel bad. Um... Wait, here's a bit of lore you guys will actually love, though. Krell had become so independent from Heinrich Klemmer that when every time Heinrich summoned him, Krell would always boss him around and call him a little faggot. Probably because it turned out that Krell was actually the vessel of Nagash, and Nagash was, um, you know, using him in his weakened undead state. Um, and Heinrich randomly also becomes a follower of Korn for some reason. So obviously, him and Arkin have a bit of a disagreement about it, and Arkin blows him up. You might be wondering, oh, Heinrich was empowered by Korn. Surely he would have beaten the uh, powerful but not godlike Arkin. Well, the answer is that Korn doesn't give a fuck about magic. Actually, Korn despises magic. So by Heinrich declaring for Korn, he was maybe even weakened. So obviously Arkin, empowered by Nagash, fucked him in the ass. As the ritual began, oh, and also he took his staff because his staff was actually the staff of Nagash not Heinrich, and he was able to use it for the ritual. Nice, 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 nice. As the ritual began, the Fae Enchantress has her throat cut as Volkmar is getting the shit beaten out of him. However, the Everchild remains defiant and calls Manfred an ugly, bald cunt and says that Arkin looks like a dried up scrotum. This impresses the shit out of Arkin, who starts thinking that the elves are more badass than him. Before the ritual can be completed, an elven army led by Eletharion and Araloth attack and a battle ensues. Manfred gets his tits beaten off by Eletharion. I'm definitely mispronouncing that. Fuck you. Um, however, before Eletharion can save the Everchild, Arkin gives him a wink and turns him to dust. Man, Arkin's really racking up a body count. Arkin then kills the Everchild and slices off Volkmar's hand and replaces it with Nagash's hand. Nagash violently takes over Volkmar's body, painfully killing Volkmar. Seeing Nagash's return, Araloth leads the elven forces back to Ithil Lauren, catching the 11am nope train and stopping off at fuck of that vill. Seeing that Nagash has indeed returned, my boy Setra unites the Tomb Kings and prepares for a battle that theoretically does not end. I'm not kidding, Nagash and Setra's forces collide, however zombies, skeleton, monsters were all being revived as quick as they were being killed, leading to weeks of just non-stop battle between millions of combatants. Nagash, Nagash gets the bright idea to go and eat the god of the underworld, hence becoming a true god himself. He goes and does this with the help of all the souls in the underworld who rise up against the uh, underworld god. What do you call it? It's not Satan, it's just, it's Egyptian, I know. Well, Egyptian, Nekaharan, you know. Now, Nagash became a god tier, uh, a god from his little uh, trip down under, and tips the battle in his favor, wiping out the Tomb King's armies and wounding Setra. Setra stands in front of Nagash, holding his big fuck off sword in defiance. Nagash is like, Hey, Skelly bro, you fought well, but I am literally your god. You cannot win. Join me and you'll be made a commander of my army. To which Setra replies, lick my rim, cunt. Setra does not serve. Setra rules. And then Nagash the exploded him, leading, leaving only his still, like, alive, quotation, head to rot in the sand. Days pass as old mate Setra's head sits in the stand, furiously venting as Nagash raised Nekahar to the ground and has the rest of the Tomb Kings kneel before him and serve him, including Kalida, who realizes that if she fights now, she'll die, but if she swears allegiance to Nagash, she'll still get an opportunity to try and kill Neferata in the future. Suddenly, Setra hears four voices in his head, laughing at him and telling him that they can grant him his revenge. 
Setra remains silent during this ordeal, however his body reforms and he finds himself imbued with chaotic power. To the fuckwits in the audience that weren't able to pick up that that was the gods of chaos who revived him in order to try and get him to assassinate Nagash, that was the chaos gods who revived him to try and get him to assassinate Nagash. Now, some people say that this isn't next part isn't canon. Well, let me tell you that there are a bunch of shit cunts and are totally wrong, as Setra does indeed kill Kolek's son Eater over a four day battle, and he does indeed cut his head off. If you disagree, you're literally worse than Isis. Yeah, so Setra goes to Archon to see what's cooking in the hood, and Archon instructs him to go and kill the now rogue Kolek, and in return, Setra will be given even more power. Setra is like, you're up, and goes and brings back Kolek's head and dumps it at Archon's feet, and he's like, and he just leaves. He's like, fucks off somewhere else. Probably to kill a few gods and shit. Cetra's, you know, it's pretty cool like that. Oh, fuck. I've been smashing the beers while doing this. So forgive my impending alcohol-fueled autism. Now, on to the Empire. While Korn was attacking Nagaroth, Slaanesh was eating Ulthuan, and Nurgle was infecting the Empire and Bretonia with super aids. I mean, he even infected Tal, the god of nature, which was very bad as... With the god of nature being sick, nature itself became AIDS. Millions died before the warriors of Nurgle even set foot in the empire, and over half the population of Bretonian peasants also died to sickness, despite the Green Knight revealing himself as Gillies the Breton and uniting Bretonia after a brutal civil war. Eventually, the remaining gods are able to cure Tal and the balance of nature is restored, dampening the effects of Nurgle's AIDS invasion. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before the end times, Balthazar Gelt had been given some pretty dope magic gifts from various undead forces such as Neferata and Vlad, which allowed him to create this massive fuck-off wall in the Empire's north borders. Oh yeah, Kislev got fucked to death with all the prisoners becoming rape slaves for Sigvald and the Ice Queen heroically dying, which is good for her, otherwise Sigvald would have literally raped and eaten her. Anyway, this super wall could not be breached by chaos, and it gave the Empire a lot of time to sort the shit out. Now, Balthazar's a powerful mage, but he couldn't keep his wall up just by, you know, clicking his fingers and using a bit of magic. No, no, no. He instead had to use faith magic and faith of the people of the Empire to keep up the wall. So when Balthazar, you know, decided to dabble in necromancy and accidentally killed an elector count, people stopped having faith in him. The wall came down and the armies of Chaos charged in with the fucking Glotkin, and they just went straight down to Altov and just raised everything in their path. The Empire... Backed up by Vlad, who was now an Elector Count, and again for, you know, being nice. And Balthazar fought against the Krom and Glotkin's armies, while the Blood Dragons betrayed the forces of good and became, wa and became warriors of Korn. The leader of the Blood Dragons stroked down Karl France with a solid torso stab. However, Karl was able to survive due to his immense amount of plot armor, and he got Deathclaw and himself back the fuck to Altdorf. The forces of Chaos siege Altov in a brutal battle, which ends in half the city being destroyed. During the battle, Lewin rocks up with a fucking gigantic army of, like, a big-ass errant army of Bretonian knights, which makes up, like, 90% of remaining Bretonian knights, and he breaks through the backline of Chaos, while Vlad, Vlad personally kills various greater demons of Nurgle like it's child's play. His body count includes Fetus Leechlord, and his severely wounded Otto Glot. Leon has his head cut off by Festus before Vlad kills Festus, so rip Leon. Carl is again impaled for like the tenth time, and he sits in a temple of Shalaya while he bleeds out. However, Teclas unbinds the vortex at this moment, and the winds of heaven choose Carl as their host. Super foul, like, Carl gets fucking, like, hyper-powered, and he ascends to a godlike figure. His ascension burns away all chaotic and undead beings in and around Altdorf, killing hundreds of thousands of ugly cunts instantly and purifying everything, making Altdorf a city of pure light and holiness. Vlad avolds, uh, avoids this flaming holy death because he thought it'd be a good idea to drink Nurgleite blood of Otto Glot, which is not a good idea at all, and it sends him in a violently vomiting and shitting himself fiasco running away from the battlefield in what I presume was utter embarrassment from being such a massive fuckwit. Now, this is where the Skaven come out to play. They finally stop their bickering and autism due to the Horned Rat appearing and eating the leader of the Council of Thirteen. He then calls the, uh, the Council of Thirteen a bunch of fuckwits and tells them to get their shit together. The United Skaven race caused some serious problems for the old world and the new as they simultaneously attack 
Dwarven holds, the Empire provinces, Cathay, Nippon, Araby, Indy, the Southern Realms, and the Lizardmen, destroying pre everything pretty easily, with the only few factions being able to put up any kind of resistance being the Lizardmen, Dwarves, and Cathay. However, these factions were unbelievably devastated by Skaven before like, they were able to get any kind of win. Cathay got anal raped in three-way war between Chaos Dwarves and Skaven and Greenskins and the Cathay armies. However, turns out Titsnitch had almost as much power as the Dragon Emperor of Cathay. As Cathay was full, I'm definitely not saying Cathay right. I'm making it sound like a fucking cafe. Just Cathay or just fuck it. Bear with me. I don't listen to audiobooks. I just read. Um, turns out Titsnitch had almost as much power as the Dragon Emperor as Cathay was full of Titsnitch cults. After insane battle was fought, um, and, um, killing so many cunts and losing all the land of Cathay, the Dragon Emperor calls it quits and takes what few survivors are left and he leaves off into the ocean on his remaining ships. His fate is unknown. I'm just gonna say he turned into a dragon, a drag, dragoned his balls over my face, I don't know. Um, needless to say, the Skaven were actually the real MVPs of destroying the world. As if it was, if they had not helped Chaos or even sided with Chaos, like Arkhan would be licking Sigma's fucking hammer right now with a broken jaw. And that broken jaw would have been from A, getting hit with the hammer and B, sucking Sigma's cock because he's gay, I don't know. You might be sitting there thinking, how the fucking fuckity fuck did Skaven beat the lizard men? Which is a fair statement, as after all, the Lizardmen had dinosaurs, millions of infantry, and the most powerful mages in the world. And that, and they lost because of three things. Bad riding, the moon exploding, and more bad riding. See, the Lizardmen knew chaos was coming, so they set up a shitload of anti-chaos wards and weapons and all these fortifications, and this worked. Chaos could not put a foot in Lustria without instantly dying. But... Skaven could. You might be like, But Major Kill, the Slan would have sensed the Skaven and been able to prepare. And yes, they would have if they weren't trying to keep the moon from crashing into the planet and destroying everything. Yep, you heard that right. Skaven used all their magic to pull the Chaos Moon Morseleb towards the planet in order to try and get the warp stone on it to flood the world with chaotic energies and give them an unlimited supply of this shit. Cause you know, it's like crack to them, it's fucked. Clan Skyra then nuked the moon and blew it up, causing the fragments to fall towards the planet. So needless to say, the Slan had their arms full, trying to firstly save the world from a literal moon landing, while then also trying to coordinate the Lizardmen into an emergency spaceship evacuation to get the fuck out of the doomed world. Most Slan gassed out from the effort and went into comas, um, trying to keep the moon away and then trying to destroy the fragments of the blown up moon. The Skaven weren't playing nice either. They sent... But they sent clan pestilence into Lustria and just holocausted the place with AIDS juice. So in between their armies vomiting and shitting themselves and their slan passing out from a block from blocking a moon, lizardmen didn't have much going for them. Even Grimlock, the mighty carnosaur ridden by Groka, perished from plagues created by Lord Skrulk himself. And here comes the darkest part of the end times in my opinion. So when the Chaos Gods were planning their invasion of the Old World, they feared only a few individuals. One of these individuals would Lord Mazamundi. As Mazamundi's slan brothers passed out from the strain of the effort of saving the world from the moon, he persisted, deleting continent-sized shards with his mind. Mazamundi refused to give up or pass out, so he kept pushing on even as he felt his heart rip itself apart from the strain. As Mazamundi got close to death, he began hearing a faint laughter in his mind. It grew louder, grew louder as his heart was tearing apart. It was the Chaos Gods laughing at him as he died alone. There were still too many shards falling and the world was about to be destroyed and Mazamundi died. Until, well like he died, but until Lord Croak, the Pepe himself, willed himself back to life and destroyed enough moon fragments that only Lustria and the Southlands were destroyed. Lord Croak then combusted into flames from the strain of the effort. So that's the Lizardmen. They were either killed by moon shards, killed by Skaven, killed by AIDS, or got on a spaceship and fucked off out of there. 
Meanwhile, Clan Morse took the fight to the dwarves, taking over many holds and in an epic three-way battle between the forces of King Belgar Ironhammer, Queek Headtaker and Skarsnik, Queek emerged victorious, taking Belgar's head off his shoulders and killing Skarsnik's favourite Squig, babe. Getting overly confident, Queek then took the fight to Thorgrim Grudgebearer, who had merged with the Law of Metal and become an extremely powerful warrior. Queek leaped at Thorgrim, only for Thorgrim to catch him midair and snap his neck with one hand, killing old mate Queek. That's pretty much all the fluff about Skaven there is. Prince Apophis went to help here because he was controlled by Nagash, and he murder raped a few thousand Skaven until they trapped him in the realms of chaos. And, you know, Tretch Cra Craventail sat in a cave and masturbated. Onto the spicy dwarfs. At the start of the end times, a lot of dwarves were like, fuck this chaos shit, let's just hide in our holds and wait it out. But Thorgrim, a bro tier dwarf, was like, stop being a bunch of fucking pussies and help me save the world. So uh, they kind of rally, but not really. The dwarves were very uh, disorganized in the way they were slaughtered. Thoric Ironbrow was attacked by Queen Neferata after the armies of Nagash had conquered the Tomb Kings. He went full Isis mode and blew up his Anvil of Doom like a nuke, killing thousands of undead and driving the forces of Neferata out of the mountain holds. Nagash himself went about and started eating a few sleeping dwarf gods to pimp himself up a bit more, but that was the end of the vampire vs dwarf battles. After killing Queek, Thorgrim ordered the retreat of his forces away from Karak Eight Peaks, and in doing so, lost the favour of the Winds of Metal, causing them to abandon him and find someone more worthy. In his now vulnerable state, Deathmaster Schnick assassinates Thorgrim, or Schnick, or the, the cool guy that kills everyone, um, assassinates Thorgrim and takes his head as his prize. Yikes. The Law of Fire binds itself to Ungrim, who is the last remaining Dwarven King, and he uses it to great effect, killing thousands of Chaos Soldiers. He makes an epic last stand against overwhelming odds in order to buy time for Karl Franz and the remaining surviving Dwarves to retreat from Zufbar. Ungrim then allows the Wind of Fire to consume him, causing a fuck-off massive explosion, killing many uh, Chaos uh, Warriors in the process. At some point, Grombrindel also comes back permanently and saves Malachus' life with a throwing axe, and forgives him for basically causing the biggest non-chaos conflict in the world. With Grombrindel back in the picture, he becomes the de facto High King of the Dwarves, and he revives the spirits of every single dwarf who has ever lived in order to right every single grudge that has ever declared by the dwarves. Fuck me, this is a long video. I should start calling myself Arch Warhammer or something like that. The Greenskin's lore should just be called The Adventures of Grimgor, as it basically just involves Grimgor uniting every single Greenskin and Ogre through the art of skull-fucking enemies to death with his massive axe. Grimgor creates the biggest war that there has ever been and just goes around killing everything. He literally genocides the Chaos Dwarfs for a laugh, allowing Gork and Mork to kill Hashut, one of the Chaos Gods. Oh yeah, and not only is Grimgor now the incarnate of beasts, but is now the avatar of not only Gork, but the Great Moor himself, who isn't even a green-skinned god, but you know, there you go. While pissing on the corpses of dead Chaos Dwarves, the green-skinned army is mysteriously teleported to Minheim in order to participate in the final battle. Now that's the main races and what they've been up to covered. As you can see, it hasn't gone as smoothly as we would have hoped for the factions, as all their lands are either destroyed or full of aids. Coming back to the Empire, we see it in terrible shape, as all the human gods were either eaten by Nagash or were killed by the gods of Chaos. 90% of Empire provinces have fallen, and to make things worse, Valton, the Empire's greatest warrior, was assassinated by a vermin lord deceiver during a duel with Archon. Now that's the main races and what they've been up to covered. As you can see, it hasn't gone as smoothly as we would have hoped for the factions, as all their lands are either destroyed or full of aids. Coming back to the Empire, we see it in terrible shape, as all the human gods were either eaten by Nagash or were killed by the gods of Chaos. 90% of Empire provinces have fallen, and to make things worse, Valton, the Empire's greatest warrior, was assassinated by a vermin lord deceiver during a duel with Archon. Now, Teclis has done a lot for the greater good, but this part was pretty fucked up. Teclis was with his dead brother, Tyrion, regretting that he was not able to save him, until he realised that if he stole the flame of Ulrich, he could not only bring back his brother, but also bind the Law of Light to him. The consequences, however, meant that Ulrich would die, and Midnight would be doomed. 
Tekla stole the flame anyway and cried like a bitch as his brother came back to life while Mindenheim was overrun without their god to protect them. Now this is the setup for the final battle. Archeon discovers that there is a third warp gate below Mindenheim, and that if he opened it, then the Chaos Gods themselves could walk the world. It would be the end of the world for sure. So Archeon begins opening the gate. Meanwhile, Nagash has turbocharged his Black Pyramid, and now it flies like a spaceship. It was pretty neat until it got shot down by the Skaven. This caused Nagash to call a meeting with the Incarnates, which include Tyrion, Incarnate of Light, Karl, Incarnate of Heavens, Malekith, Incarnate of Shadow, Alariel, Incarnate of Life, Caradrian, Incarnate of Fire, and Belthazar, Incarnate of Metal. The Law of Death was bound to Sylvania, as Nagash was having trouble absorbing it due to the wonky ritual that was used to revive him, and the Law of Beasts went to Grimgore. Anywho, the Incarnates all meet up for an emergency, the world is ending, what do we do meeting, except for Grimgore because he's still teabagging cunts in the Darklands, and old mate Nagash rocks up and is like, hey guys, I'm sorry for trying to kill pretty much all of you on separate occasion, but let's be friends now. And everyone is like, hmm, only if we get to torture Manfred for fun. And Nagash is like, fuck yeah, deal. So Manfred spent the next few hours with his nutsack clipped to a car battery. Lilith, the last remaining god who isn't undead or chaos, goes to her babe Teclas and is like, hey man, I fucked up a bit and my master plan failed, my master plan failed so it's time for plan B. So Lilith allows Teclas to stab her and kill her in order to grant Teclas enough power to teleport all the incarnates and their armies, including our dwarf raping friend Krimgor, Chaos Dwarf at the moment raping friend Grimgor, to Minheim in a desperate last attempt to save the world. Upon arriving, Grimgor is suitably confused as one minute he was teabagging a stunty and the next minute he was face to face with Malekith. As Grimgor raises his axe to swing at Malekith, Malekith literally says this, Hey Grimgor, you are the best, but that over there Archon, oh no no no, he think he the best, so you should go fuck him up. And Grimgor's like, Grimgor's like, okay, yeah, all right, yeah, I'll do that. Hence began the biggest battle the world has ever seen. I won't go into super detail about it, but because it's long and a lot of shit happens, but Caradrian gets crushed by a big ass bloodthirster, Grimgor gets his head sliced off after kicking Archon really hard in the dick, and Setra also makes an appearance, flicks his bony wiener at Nagash before declaring a jihad against Chaos, stating, Because those Chaos cunts try to control me and order me around, I'll kill them all, and then I'll kill you, Nagash. Then Setra jumps into the massive Norskan army of monsters that Throg brought with him and begins a dance that involves decapitating hundreds of monsters. Sigvald beats Krell to death because Krell scratched his face and made him less pretty, and then in turn gets his head crushed in by Throg, because Sigvald tried to kill Throg earlier for being ugly. Sigvald, get the fuck over yourself, you blonde Aryan cunt. Then, Throg, to add a bit of insult to the old, uh, already crushed and ugly looking Sigvald, pisses on his corpse. The good guys are winning the battle. Grumbrindle is fucking cunts left, right and center as Teclas and Balthazar work to close the warp gate. Sigma enters Karl's body, returning to the world and beating the tits off Archeon, while Gortek is in the battle side by side, with Grombrindle fucking cunts as well. Archeon gets thrown into the warp by Sigma, however the most retarded shit happens. Manfred was protecting Balthazar as he was closing the warp gate, but decides that it would be funnier to just end the world instead, so he stabs Balthazar in the back, killing him. I should also note before I go on that Aberash and the Green Knight, fan favourites for sure, definitely up there on my list, were actually in Bretonia with the Red Duke and a few other Bretonian heroes, making their last stand. So that's what they were doing. Um, unfortunately, their ending on their current status is unknown because Games Workshop are just a bunch of fucking dickheads. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what happened to them. Anyway, back to the main battle of Minheim. The death of Balthazar causes a ricochet effect as the law of metal flies to Teclas, who cannot simply handle the winds of fire, beasts, and metal at the same time. So he explodes. This destabilizes the ritual, and then Nagash has to absorb all the winds of magic, blowing him up as well. This uh, like explosion of his death causes the warp gate to fully open and consume the world. Athel Lauren is the last place to be consumed, as Malekith, Alariel, and Tyrion sit next to the Oak of Ages, looking depressed and calling Archeon a cock lover. Everyone dies. All factions are destroyed. All hail chaos. Fucking rip.
I've made a lot of videos on the end times guys which go into detail about various characters. This video is more of meant to be a big summary and it basically pressing 10 books of lore into a 30-40 minute video. I'll link everything in the description that you guys will need and remember if you had any questions about any characters that I missed um, or I didn't flesh out enough in this video then just ask me. I, I, I see all comments. I reply to all comments. We Gucci. Like, comment, and subscribe for more of this autistic shit bullshittery, and also join the Discord if you want to see my nudes. Have a sick one, cunts.